Jared, in trying to understand the human mind, there are many approaches, biological, psychological. I'd like to explore with you the human mind within social structure and how that has, in an iterative way, affected the development of our mentality. So let, please describe the structures of human societies from the simplest to the most complex, and then let's explore how that might affect the development of human mentality. When we think of human society, we think of the human societies that we are accustomed to, and they are societies in which we regularly encounter strangers every day, we don't freak out about it, um, in which there is a government that has views about how we should treat our old people and our children, in which there's inequality, in which some people do different things and some people earn more than, than other people and some people have more power. We take that for granted. But that's all new in human history. Until 10,000 years ago, all human societies were what we would call today band level or tribal level societies, similar to the societies that I encounter in New Guinea and that are in the Amazon. Hunter gatherers, which were everybody before agriculture, they live in groups of a few dozen people. They're relatively egalitarian. Everybody can do rather, rather similar things and has the same rights. Um, they're nomadic. You don't deal with strangers except to kill them or negotiate with them. Then as you get farming, you have societies, tribal societies with several hundred people, and still you know everybody and you got names for them, and the people next door, they're bad people with whom you, you occasionally make peace and, and fight. But it's still egalitarian. Then once you get a few <coughs> thousand society, people, more farming, more food, thousands of people, then you, you have to have leaders decision makers because a thousand people can sit and have a discussion. You've got to have a leader. But that means inequality because the leader's got to be fed by other people and the bureaucrats have got to be fed by other people. And then finally you have societies with state governments, which is what we've got today, with at least tens of thousands and nowadays up to a billion and a half people with leaders and lots of, lots of inequality and strangers all over the place. Uh, but all of that diversity of human societies has arisen in the last 10,000 years. Okay, so that's the framework. And, and as we look at the development of, of an individual human mind in each of those societies, how can we see differences in terms of, of the enrichment, the complexification of our mental faculties? An example that I'll give you from my experience in New Guinea um, is simply in the in social interactions and in the amount of time that one spends talking. New Guineans, I was struck early on that they are talking constantly. And friends of mine who work with the San people of Southern Africa and other traditional societies, they are impressed by how much of the time these people spend talking. Well, they spend all that time talking because they don't have the technological substitutes. They don't have television, they don't have, they don't have books. Uh, when I come back to the United States from time in New Guinea, uh, I have to learn to be <laughs> silent. Uh, I have to learn not to be constantly with people. Um, I have to learn not to be insulted if I'm not to get full attention. In New Guinea, if I'm talking with someone, there's full attention. He's not pulling out a cell phone or text messaging. But my sons, my beloved sons who I loved, when they come over for, for dinner, they're text messaging. And yes, they'll talk and then they'll go back to their phone and see what messages have come in. Um, so the split brain operation that we have today, traditionally it didn't exist. That's a big change in human mentality. And, and what are the implications of that? Is that, is that an, an advancement uh, in terms of, of the sophistication and the kinds of things that we can do? Or, or conversely, are there some cultural defects that, that occur at the same time in terms of uh, personal relationships or, or emotional stability? We will note the answer to that question at the rate we're going in a in a decade or two, because there's a lot of lot of concern um, in in U.S. and other first world societies today um, about the consequences of multitasking and the ch the change in personal relationships. The, the personal relationships in traditional society they are face to face. You see another person as another person, but increasingly in the U.S. today, our 
relationships are secondhand. They're indirect. They're mediated by media. They're on the phone, or they're not even on the phone. They're by email. Uh, 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 I wonder whether the marked decrease in civility in the United States that we've seen in the last 10 or 15 years that's, that people discuss much discuss much in a political context. Uh, is that because we've gotten so far from tribal societies that other people are no longer people that we're used to face to face, but they're things that are showing up on a cell phone yeah. screen or their yeah. voice on your recorder. And so they're, not, they're less and less human and we less and less identify with them. And so we can be more routinely mean to them. Let's look at the development over longer periods of time uh, in, the, in the development of Homo sapiens, the human species, uh, in terms of the, what, what we feel is the mental life that, that we have today. Uh, how much do you see that each individual social structure, going back to the, 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 the tribal days or, or the agricultural movement, how much of those environments affected the, the, the richness of the mental life? I'll answer that, and the vast majority of Americans don't like my answer. Um, my experience in New Guinea is that with this constant social s stimulation, um, when I went out to New Guinea, I went out naive. I knew that they had stone tools. I thought primitive technology. I thought they were primitive people. It took me about a day to realize that mentally they're... <coughs> They're at least as alert as Americans, and gradually I realized that that on the average, New Guinean, they're they're more curious than Americans. They're more they're they're more constantly interactive than Americans. They're more interested. Life there is just much more vivid than life in the United States. It's a very powerful statement. It is a powerful statement, and there are lots of people who really get angry when they hear me say that because they, they, they want to believe that these primitive people um, are primitive in other respects, that they are primitive in their intelligence, and it's bad enough to say that New Guineans are as intelligent as Americans. To suggest that they might be more curious and more probing, oh boy, of all, uh, uh, in my book, Guns, Germ, Steel, about 450 pages. The one page that makes people angrier than any other page is a paragraph in which I say, it's my impression, I can't prove it, it's my impression the New Guineans are more curious <laughs> and, uh, and at least as intelligent as Americans. Well, the implications of that could even go further than what the parochial feelings of some Americans may be, because it could speak to the fundamental nature of the human brain and the human mind across the world being very, very similar. And so what we envision to be the, uh, the advanced state of our mentality because of our social structure uh, may not be the case if what you're saying is true. And therefore, there's, there's great similarity in, 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 in the basic structure of what all human beings have is very, very similar. That's true. The basic structure of what humans have today, among the humans that exist today, is basically the same. Again, I went out to New Guinea naive, and I gradually discovered that, that, that I'm scared when they're scared, and I'm crying when they're crying, and I'm happy when they're, they're happy, and I'm excited when they're happy, when, when they're excited. So there's good rapport on all those, on, on all those levels. Um, a, a, another experience that I had when I went out there. I didn't know what their language was going to be. I love learning languages. So when I got to New Guinea and I was among the foray people, I began learning. For, I got people to, to talk with me. I wrote it down. And I thought that this would be some primitive language. Instead, I gradually discovered that so it's got first, second, and third person pronouns. It's got singular, dual, and plural. English doesn't have a dual. It's got postpositions rather than prepositions. All right, but I had already learned Finnish, and Finnish has postpositions. It has the close and the distant demonstratives, or not just here, there, but here, there, a little distance, there, far. OK, Latin already, I knew had a couple of demonstratives. So the foray language was more complicated than English. And in general, New Guinea languages and traditional languages, uh, the, it's not the case that languages of so-called primitive people are simpler. Every language that we know is a fully complex language. 
And the implications for that is that there is great commonality among the human species today, and that uh, some who, who would argue for the, uh, the, the higher level of, uh, of Western civilization uh, it, it, are, are not just culturally biased, but they're physiologically ignorant. It's rubbish, I would say. The, the, the reasons for the power of Western civilization has nothing to do with Westerners themselves, but it has to do with the, the sheep and the wheat and the peas and the flax that certain hunter-gatherers domesticated in the Fertile Crescent 10,000 years ago, and that got passed on eventually to Europe. But New Guinea did not have wheat and barley and sheep, and that's the reason why you and I are here talking English rather than you and I being New Guineans talking for, right? It's not our brains, it's our sheep. <laughs>